Hi and welcome. Um, so this little video is going to be about the Islamic State. Uh, a lot of you will have heard about it in the news. It is in the area uh, where Syria and Iraq and they're trying to form a new uh, nation of their own but they are beheading people and that is yeah, upsetting a lot of people uh, both in the Western world and in the Muslim community. Um, so a lot of people are interested what is happening, why and how to move on. So I would like to give you at least my views on this uh, matter. Um, if you want to see where this is coming from, I think the best place to look would be in the aftermath of the First World War. The whole region, which is now known as the Middle East, was a part of the Ottoman Empire. When uh, the Ottoman chose to side with the, the Central Powers uh, during the First World War, the uh, Entente Powers, uh, being uh, yeah, Russia, uh, England, uh, Great Britain and France, um, were yeah, not so happy, they were the opposite sides. Russia quit the war relatively early, before the end. Um, and the British were quite active in fighting against the Ottomans in the Middle East. One of the things they uh, did is to uh, orchestrate an Arab uprising. So they did pretty much the same as the, uh, what the Americans did during both Gulf Wars. They went to talk with local chiefs and local leaders and offered them power, independence, freedom, uh, the right to uh, form their own state, to govern their own people and well just like in the two last Gulf Wars also in the First World War uh, the local chiefs yeah, listened and they felt gosh this would be a great idea to have our own state, our own culture, our own people unified by, under our own leadership instead of under some colonial oppressor and they decided to uh, help the British to oust the Ottomans. Um, well, we all know what happened at the aftermath. Um, there was no freedom, there was no support, there was just a change of master. So, um, the area where the, the Shiites and uh, the Sunni people lived, and also many different tribes uh, lived, was subdivided into British protectorates and French protectorates. The borders of these protectorates are basically the na national borders we have today. And, uh, well, with some small exceptions. But basically these borders were drawn for also very specific reasons. To prevent unification of people of a single tribe, a single faith, a single culture. If in one country there would be a majority of people of the same culture, um, then very quickly they would yeah, be unified and train, try to claim control over their own nation. But if in your newly shaped nation you combine lots of different minorities uh, who can't get along well with each other, the result is that they cannot form a fist, they cannot unify very easily against the yeah, uh, imperialist powers. So this is the reason why the map looks the way it does at uh, present. This is also why the yeah, roughly 20, 30, 40 million Kurdish people uh, don't have a homeland because their homeland was divided over six different nations. This is also why there's a lot of fighting between the Shiites and Sunnis because they were stuffed into one nation. Um, so a lot of the core problems is with the division of the countries and what is now being attempted by, uh, yeah, of course, the Western powers is to maintain that division of countries, to keep people divided, to keep culture splintered, uh, because as long as they're divided, as long as they're fighting against yeah, their own governments or arguing amongst themselves, then they're easy to influence, easy to control, because they all are looking for money, support and help 
and where are they going to turn to except to the powerful Western, Western nations. So this gives the Western powers a lot of influence in the region, a lot of power in the region, because we control trade, uh, we control arms, we control technology, so they can't really do without us. Um, unified uh, yeah, people are of course very much a threat to yeah, the Western control over that region. Uh, the Western control is already quite damaged because in the aftermath of the Second World War um, it was decided to follow the so-called two-pillar strategy. So people were thinking how to control the region and it was decided, okay, we will create two super states in that region which can dominate all other lesser states for us. And those two super states were to be Persia and um, uh, Israel. And both of them received a lot of aid, yeah, uh, both militarily, uh, technologically, uh, in trade, uh, to create yeah, powerful and trustworthy allies in the region. Well, the two-pillar solution kind of started to fail when uh, the Shah of Iran was deposed. The U.S. has, uh, yeah, of course, a strong tendency to back dictators as, yeah, a kind of a counterbalance against popular uprisings, which are associated with communism in this Cold War era. Another weapon in the U.S. arsenal is uh, Muslim fundamentalism and this may seem a little bit strange to yeah, some of the less informed listeners but um, during the Cold War the US decided uh, was very afraid of the domino effect that like people would rise up in a communist rebellion take over one country and then inspire the workers in the next country over and then one by one all countries would quickly turn dom uh, yeah, communist so they needed to have a stopgap, something which would hold a country from going into communism, even though it was a dictatorship. And the solution to this problem was religious fundamentalism. One of the doctrines of communism is that religion is the opium of the people and it is used by the ruling caste to yeah, control the people Therefore, the people cannot be free as long as there is religion. So religion is an enemy of the people and needs to be gotten rid of. And uh, of course, the people who are strongly religious will therefore never yeah, really support a communist regime or a communist coup. And uh, with the aid of the CIA and lots of corporate operatives who started to give funding, weapons, training, uh, a very strong a uh, band of uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, Islam was created all around the Soviet Union and even within uh, the Eastern Bloc countries, mainly Yugoslavia, as we've all seen from the war in Yugoslavia, in which the Americans also came to aid their allies were being attacked by the Serbs. And this was then also dubbed uh, by the Serbs the communist boomerang, when uh, uh, or the terrorist boomerang when um, ultimately the uh, US started to lose control over the religious fundamentalists they had created and whom they had trained in terror tactics and guerrilla warfare um, because with the collapse of the Soviet Union they were no longer yeah, trying to fight off communism uh, and they started to look for other enemies, other impure ones who were, yeah, uh, in a way, obstructing them from uh, their faith or distracting them from their faith or ruining their, yeah, culture. And then when communism disappeared as an enemy, it turned out that the Western world and the US in particular were seen as the most insidious influence in destroying their culture, in being a danger to established religion, culture and uh, all kinds of practices. So then it became a large problem. But ultimately it was still a controllable problem because once um, the 
second pillar had collapsed, they started to build a new pillar. They, uh, the Western countries started to give uh, arms, weapons and support to Saddam Hussein to build a strong Iraq. And uh, Saddam Hussein uh, created a secular state, uh, which basically had nothing to do with religious fundamentalism. It was completely outlawed and banned in his region. And along comes the first Gulf War. In the first Gulf War, um, uh, President Bush uh, Sr. Uh, realized that Saddam Hussein is an important stabilizing factor, so he betrayed his allies, the Kurds mainly, who he said he would help to depose uh, Saddam Hussein and let him retreat with his um, the elite forces of his army, the Republican Guard, so he could restore order in his country and yeah, maintain the stabilizing force in the region. Unfortunately, his son, Bush Jr., um, had different plans. And for the Second World the Gulf War, there were two scenarios. There was the uh, military scenario, which was drafted by the experts on the region and uh, the uh, generals and specialists in the Pentagon. And there was Mr. Bush's own little private scenario. Well, it's obvious which scenario was followed, but I'll tell you of the two. So, <coughs> the idea of the Pentagon was basically to have a massive troop commitment to commit a million soldiers um, to uh, Iraq so that with the fall of uh, Saddam Hussein there would not be a lawlessness, anarchy or a power vacuum. There would be enough troops and boots on the ground to immediately keep and maintain control and to set up a confederacy to use the allies they had forged in preparing for the uh, attack on <coughs> Saddam Hussein and grant all the tribal leaders and people's uh, autonomy and a seat in a, yeah, in a council where they could jointly govern the state. Um, this was rejected by uh, the Bush administration and his political advisors. Uh, because they wanted to have a war on the cheap, they didn't want to commit more than 100,000 people, even though that would mean plundering, anarchy, rape, murder, lawlessness. Um, the second thing is that they decided to betray all their allies, so everybody they made an agreement with about self-governance, uh, freedom to govern your own people, and um, all of them were yeah, basically either told to shut up and keep quiet and follow orders or they were jailed and tortured by the CIA. Um, so this didn't really help to make the, uh, yeah, the country like the West more. Um, and uh, basically all the cultural treasures and religious treasures which were there were basically looted or destroyed. So the cultural identity of the people was also very much damaged, which of course fell very well in line with uh, yeah, bringing them along and making them a Western nation on yeah, the Western setting and thereby, yeah, in a way, Americanizing the Iraqi people. Um, and also they had to be uh, yeah, stuffed into a kind of American system of federal government in which there is yeah, relatively little power or freedom of the, uh, of the local governments and all finances, all power is centralized and taken away from the local yeah, chiefs and power holders. Um, so of course this created a lot of rebellions as yeah, we all know. So the next story is that um, they um, left an extremely uh, divided country and try to uh, yeah, install democracy in it. And this is of course not going to work because even though Americans are different in different states, all in all they more or less share the same culture, they share the same language, they mostly share the same religion and generally they see eye to eye on things and they they have a agreed upon way to work things out and to compromise because each side knows that the other side can be a pain in the ass and yeah and the way elections go sometimes turn things around and then they'll have their revenge but such a system of 
yeah, uh, democracy and such a tradition doesn't exist in uh, yeah, large parts of the Middle East. Um, so what you get there is basically dictatorship by the, majori uh, by the majority. So if one side is stronger, they will jail and repress the other side. And of course, this will repression, uh, violent repression leads to violent opposition. So you get more attacks and civil wars. The other thing which uh, was now given free reign is, well, the religious impulse, which had been suppressed for so long. Uh, finally was allowed to come back into uh, Iraq thanks to the American invasion and the removal of the secular regime. Now one of these uh, groups is uh, trying to re-establish the caliphate. Um, in a way I think it is an inevitability that people who share culture, share language, share religion um, would like to have self-governance, would like to have freedom, would like to be free from outside interference and ultimately yeah, have some form of independence. So that the Kurdish people are rebelling, that the Sunnis and the Shiites don't want to sit in the same place and various other tribal and cultural differences yeah, are, playing, are playing up is only natural. The question is how to solve it. Well. The American solution is to, well, bomb people, kill people. But this is not a fundamental solution, because ultimately this is not redrawing the map or giving freedom to one group or the other. I think ultimately it's the striving of the caliphate to unite its people is something which one way or the other will have to happen. Of course this is not to the liking of Israel at all because then it will not no longer find itself surrounded by a patchwork of nations all with their internal troubles but it will find itself neighboring a super state which has no internal troubles. So there is a very strong impetus to prevent the unification uh, also for Western countries because yeah then they could have a unified regime and uh, they would be uh, yeah, a lot stronger also in negotiations and be able to gain independence from the Western world much more easily. Um, so the question is what do we want? Do we want to maintain as Western powers uh, control over this region by turning it into a war zone, having continuous bloodshed, civil war? Now we're getting the results of it. The technology has progressed, borders have opened, so now the Western world is flooded with refugees. And what to do with all the millions of refugees from these war countries? Where to put them all, how to employ them, how to deal with their yeah, conflict of culture when they try to live according to their cultural values which collide with European co cultural values. So we're now getting the fallout of our own yeah, political decisions. And I think that our political leaders now have to decide if we continue to destabilize the region and continue uh, yeah, supporting this division, um, then we will ha also have a continuous fallout, either in the form of terrorist attacks or in the form of refugees coming to our nations. The other side is, okay, perhaps we should help them along and try to help them to unify their people, redraw the map, so that people of yeah, different cultural groups, different religious groups, uh, can form their own independent nations within a, a healthy framework in which they have autonomy. Well, it is very clear where the Western powers are going at the moment. The question is, will they succeed? How long will they be able to well, pit one side against the other? Now, of course, they're trying also to use the Islamic State, which is basically mainly based on Sunni and Sunnism, and to pit that against their other enemy, Iran, and to see if those two can't fight it out, the way they've also done in Syria, because it draws a lot of soldiers, a lot of money, a lot of power away from these nations in internal fighting. But if these nations become unified, then that will no longer be possible to yeah, 
get them to waste their energies on each other and they will start to rebuild, gain power and gain prominence in the world. Ultimately, I think as we are in a way on the verge of building a new worldwide culture um, in which we have free trade, um, human rights um, and personal freedoms and I think personal freedoms will become increasingly important even though they have been decreasing for years and years and years now. I think ultimately people want and deserve to be free of government intervention and people are getting more and more mature, getting more and more informed and the media is slowly but surely losing its grip. So ultimately I think in maybe 40-50 years we'll see that people are able to govern themselves truly instead of true yeah, mockeries of democracy as we have now which are mainly controlled by lobby groups and big finance groups. Um, and I think also that even if there would be like a theocracy or a caliphate, um, ultimately that too will turn into a state with more and more freedoms, with more and more local autonomy, because it is very hard for a nation which doesn't have the technological means of the Western world to control every citizen, to control and check every email, every phone conversation, every bank transaction to keep control over the country. And I think in a way that their lack of technology and, uh, is in a way a guarantee for the freedom of its citizens. A guarantee which unfortunately in the US and Western Europe we are lacking and therefore we are losing our freedoms and privacy. Because more and more um, the threat of terrorism is used to deprive people of their rights. Uh, free speech has been abolished in the Netherlands because if a person says something which can be construed as sedition or inciting to terrorism, the person is, well, jailed, uh, their nationality is stripped from them and they are kicked out of the country. And who decides what is right and wrong to say? The government does. And I think this is a very troubling thing when the government decides uh, what to do and also especially so if it decides what to do without a recourse to the legal system, without the intervention of judges. You've seen it happen in the United States which started to assassinate its own citizens without any legal recourse on uh, yeah, suspicion of terrorism. It also started to torture people on suspicion of terrorism and it is now listening to everybody's voicemail, email and probably also this video message. And the same will happen very quickly in Europe, is happening in Europe and pretty soon every other country in the world will follow. And what is the driving force beneath this, behind this? It is because when communism in a way collapsed, capitalism had no more checks there's no more reason not to oppress the masses, not to exploit them, not to make them poor, not to turn them into wage slaves. Because there is no communist party to, yeah, in a way form the core of the rebellion or the repression. There is no danger of a communist coup anymore. And this is why, in a way, capitalism has gone overboard because it's lost its natural enemy, it has lost its balance and now we're seeing more and more the true face of capitalism which is the rich people getting richer, having all the power, the poor people having less and less power and the elite um, yeah, forming more and more a police state, a dictatorship in which every citizen has to follow the rules and the laws which are so-called democratic but are basically uh, created by the lobbies of the influential people and the big business companies. And you wonder why certain people don't want to westernize. I think if we had a healthy and indeed free and model western society as we always claim to have, I don't think there would be resistance in the Islamic part of the world to yeah, being 
a civilized Western, uh, having a civilized Western state. I think they would like to have that freedom. I think they would like to have the technology. I think they would like to have the education. But what they see, and I think rightly so, is that more and more the poor people, and which is mainly their countries, are being used as wage, wage slaves and they have no less and less influence on international affairs, both internal and uh, internationally. And they don't like where it is going, and neither do I. And I think it's very natural for them to resist. Although I would have hoped that their form of resistance would have been less bloody. Thank you for listening, and I hope it's given you some food for thought.